Welcome to Steel Stories by US Steel. In this podcast, we explore the wealth of knowledge from leading industry experts to help you navigate the infinitely developing, renewable world of steel. Welcome back to Steel Stories, CEO edition. In this episode, US Steel President and CEO Dave Burrett chats with Jim Bullard, the former president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve and the current dean of the Mitchell E. Daniels Jr. School of Business at Purdue University. This is a great conversation about the economy, monetary policy, inflation, and a lot more. I think you'll learn a lot. I know I did. And for those of you who are fans of the OG Steel Stories, as we like to call it, don't worry. We'll be back soon with another episode of your favorite Steel podcast. So enjoy. Uh, it's great that you're able to join us today. We have a, a special guest, Jim Bullard. I'm sure you know him. Uh, many of you uh, know that he's been uh, with the uh, St. Louis Fed, I think, for a longer period of time than anybody that had held that position. He's had an illustrious career. He really doesn't need much of an introduction. But now, as you can see from his background, he's a dean uh, at what's called uh, the reimagined Mitchell E. Daniels School of Business at Purdue. And uh, he's been there just since uh, late last year. I think it was August 15. So, uh, uh, Jim, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, we're in this deeply cyclical business, so we know the Fed matters. And since you've been there for such a long time and now you're moving in another area, we're very much interested in how did you get into banking and how did you get to where you are now? Well, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm a PhD in economics, and I joined the research staff at, in St. Louis uh, in the 1990s. And then in uh, 2008, uh, I became president of the bank, and I held that position for about 15 years. So the way the Fed works is that they're there's a board of governors in Washington, D.C., but there are 12 banks around the spread around the country. St. Louis is one of those. If you take the presidents of all the banks and the seven governors in Washington, you get the open market committee. That's the one that you read about in the newspapers, and that's the one that uh, drives policy for the Federal Reserve System. So I was on that for 15 years, and... Uh, those are the guys that bring you interest rates. Uh, so uh, we do a lot with interest rate policy. Uh, so I have a mix of uh, academic background, uh, lots of research, lots of papers, uh, but also practical experience uh, in actual policy making and as a CEO of the bank. The bank itself, St. Louis Fed, uh, is about uh, 1,500 employees. Fed as a whole is about 20, uh, over 20,000 employees. And uh, we run monetary policy and many other things for the for the U.S. So I, as CEO, as that you know, directly responsible for the St. Louis part of the operation. But I'm also was also a system executive, so I had dotted line on many other responsibilities across the Federal Reserve System. What an exciting time to be at the Fed! You know, from from the the time of the Great Recession through the pandemic, and then the inflation, and working through all that. Could you could you tell us a little bit about how the Fed responded during those times? A little bit of history and bring us up to the present, if you could. I think that everybody would find that very interesting, especially since, as I said, we are so deeply cyclical. We are impacted by virtually every move the Fed makes. Yeah, I was. Uh... Just thinking about it as you're talking, the um, uh, you know the run up to the pandemic, as you know, uh, probably from your own experience, was just very fast coming in just days and hours, and you had to make a lot of split second uh, decisions, and and everything was moving so quickly, and I remember taking a call with uh, my directors. We have a private sector board of directors in St. Louis, and it was pouring rain outside. And I said, well, that's about what's happening here. It's pouring rain. <laughs> and uh, the economy is going to be bad for during March and April of, of 2020. Um, I do think the Fed, and I give a lot of credit to Chair Powell, uh, did a great job during this period. Uh, we, uh, 
Uh, again, things are moving very, very quickly. Uh, we had a meeting scheduled on a Tuesday and Wednesday, but we moved it up to a Sunday. We were 48 hours earlier because we thought uh, we couldn't wait till Tuesday and Wednesday to do that. Uh, and we lowered the policy rate at that meeting, made it many other adjustments, but that was the start of a pretty big policy response that was designed to protect the U.S. economy from further damage other than what you would get from the pandemic itself. And I think that was largely successful. If you look at uh, financial stress index and the St. Louis Fed has a, uh, its own financial stress measure that you can look at online and anyone that's listening to this should get the FRED app uh, from the St. Louis Fed, that's the Federal Reserve Economic Data. But you can check out the uh, financial stress index and it skyrocketed during March and April of 2020. So what could have happened, it was at 2008 levels, the level of financial stress. No one was sure what was gonna happen. I'm sure your team wasn't sure you know, what was around the corner. And it could have turned into a financial crisis as well. So you would have had the pandemic and then a financial crisis on top of that. Uh, we, that didn't happen, and I think that's because of the very aggressive response of the Federal Reserve. Um, by the time you got to May, uh, June, July, August of 2020, financial stress was back down at pre-pandemic levels. And so we only had one problem to deal with then, the, the recovery from the onset of the pandemic. So. I think that uh, is an unsung uh, success of the whole era, and um, a lot of that was done in conjunction with the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. Congress. I think at that time there's a lot of unity around the idea that you wanted to get a very good response on the economy side, and you want to do err on the side of doing too much, uh, and then many other things happen later. But I think that initial response. Uh, will be uh, go down in textbooks as an ideal response to that kind of a stressful shock to the economy. Well, you know, you mentioned that because for us, we remember that time very well. I think we hit like $4 a share. It was a yeah. scary, scary time for us. And yet we had so much confidence in the Fed's response that I think it was May or June where we said we were in the process of buying uh, Big River Steel. We had purchased half of it, and we made the decision, you know, we're going to go for this. Everybody get ready. We don't know what's going to happen, but get prepared to get this thing done. And we were able to consummate the deal by the end of the year because we believed that things were coming back. And of course, I don't know how this is possible. One month of recession or whatever it was, but you guys really did save save the economy. It, it was very impressive. And I know and, and maybe maybe I drift into that a little bit because you sure get punished a lot with some of the commentary from a lot of people. Is it because, you, well, first you have to be thick skinned on on the on the job you have in the Fed, but but is it because people don't really understand it? Because then they get into this transitory inflation, and is it? I mean, to me, maybe I'm just dumb, but I, I always think inflation's always transitory. It's a change, uh, so it's going to be yeah. up or down, and. And, and so, yeah. uh, you know, how did you get conviction that that was the right thing to do? It was a, the, the experience you had in 2008 that gave you that strength of getting after it fast? Yeah. I. Uh, by the way, I, I've toured Big River Steel. Oh, uh, have North you? East Ar yes, oh, Northeast great. Arkansas. That was part of my district. One of the most fascinating tours uh, I've ever taken ah. was uh, all about the, the newer technology that they had there. Fantastic uh, purchase on your part. Uh, uh, when I was there, it was right when it was opening, and I think they were profitable in their first month or two, uh, right when they opened. So uh, very impressive. Um, yeah, so uh, inflation didn't really come uh, until 2021. And so when you're sitting in late 2020 or even the first quarter of 2021, uh, there was really no inflation in the system and, it, and no one was forecasting uh, much inflation at that point. Um, I mean, I had my doubts at that point, but no one really had a forecast that there would be much inflation. When you got to March, April, May of 2021, you started to see the inflation really come on, and uh, that was where the transitory debate uh, really got started. Um, some people thought that would just be a blip. 
Um, but by the time you got to June, July, August, it, it uh, was still there, and then it got much worse in the second half of 2021. And that's really the period when uh, certainly I turned down policy and, and wanted to get a lot more hawkish a lot faster. And uh, that culminated in the spring of 2022, uh, where we started raising rates. And then we started raising rates very fast, um, 75 basis points per meeting for four meetings in a row. Uh, Jay Powell's uh, speech at Jackson Hole in 2022 was only nine minutes. It only talked about inflation and that we had to get inflation under control. Very impressive. Uh, and then uh, I think that that's really what set the tone. Uh, uh, like so many things in your business, uh, the, le any kind of leadership situation, you've got to set the tone. And the tone was the Fed is not going to tolerate inflation above the inflation target. We're going to get it back to the inflation target. and We're going to do it as quickly as possible. And I think that's what that sequence of rate increases really signaled. And lo and behold, by the time you got to the last part of 2021 into 2022, you did see inflation start to come down. Now it's come, it's come down quite a ways, and so we've made a lot of progress during 2023. Yeah, can you talk about that? I saw one of your interviews where you talked about the two percent because I'm always one of the. Can't you let the inflation just go a little higher because that would help obviously our business in the short term. I realize that you know, but but I heard your <laughs> comments on that, which really resonated with me and and because i i hear other people say that as well why do we have to go to two percent can't we just two and a half or three could you talk about that yeah it's uh the the literature after volcker volcker was in the 1980s in the early part of the 1980s and he did get inflation under control but he did it the hard way uh his his method was uh, he didn't have any credibility at all when he came in as chair of the federal reserve in 1979 and uh, inflation was absolutely skyrocketing, the number one political issue. Um, and uh, he had to raise the policy rate all the way up to 20% uh, at one point and uh, caused a big recession. And he did bring inflation under control, but, but that's the hard way to do it. I think that the easy way to do it is to make sure you say ahead of time what your inflation target is and then conduct policy in a way that keeps sending inflation back to that target, then you don't get into these situations like we got into in the 1970s. But you have to make credibility of that target. If you're going to say that, well, I'll let the target slip, or you know, I'll, you know, it's okay for now, or I'll, I'll uh, tolerate inflation, then you don't really have a target anymore, and those inflation expectations become unmoored and uh, this causes more problems than it solves. So, um, so I think it's better to, uh, and it's kind of management 101, set your target uh, and then take steps always to be achieving that. Then everyone knows what the, what the policy is. Everyone can coordinate on that, and then you get the best outcomes for the economy. Yeah, in our speak, we say, what's your mission? Then what are your goals? What are your critical success, yep. success factors and the actions to achieve that? So it makes it makes up a, a whole lot of sense. So it, it, the thing that is top of mind for me all the time, and I'm just by nature always paranoid, you know, and I, I like the phrase all, only Andrew Grove, Grove so eloquently said, you know, only the paranoid survive. And, and I certainly feel like I'm always looking at the downside and course uh I, I keep waiting for this recession in fact i told my team get ready for it it's gonna happen you know the yield curve i'm, I'm an old financial guy so i spent a, a bit of time looking at that and i, re, I was uh, the cfo at caterpillar um back in uh, uh, 2008 in 2007 our uh, chairman actually is a um, uh, econometric phd and he basically said on an earnings call we're going to have a really deep recession and he crashed the market you know so uh -huh. um, but everybody was saying at that time, those four words, it's different this time. And it rarely is. And then I think, you know, soft landing, I don't know that I've ever, you know, I'm pretty old and I don't remember one. And so I automatically think, well, it's different this time with uh, the, the, the yield curve. Well, people said that back in 2007 and and, you know, it was going to be this uh, kind of like the the uh, the, uh, the developing world was going to keep going strong and the U.S. could come down. It was going to be different. And 
I, I keep hearing that. Well, it's, it is different. And now everybody's positioned from, well, you know, the pandemic was the thing that was different. And it really does seem like a soft landing. And then my arguments are, okay, have you thought about the geopolitical stuff? Just look at it at home. Are we going to shut down the economy? You know, we got issues of massive divisiveness. Uh, we got the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East. We got the Taiwan and, and Chinese uh, potential problems there. And everything just seems a little tense. So I would say all things being the same, okay, yeah, soft landing. But I got to believe something's going to come in in there and send a gust of wind in that's going to set us off course. Now, what we have to do is just be nimble no matter what happens. But it sure does help a cyclical business to know is it going to get better or is it going to get worse? So can you shed some light on, you believe there could be this soft landing or it just, it's like the weather, you can't really predict it a year out. Yeah, I think uh, I'll come back to geopolitical risk, but I do think the policy that we implemented uh, in 2022, you know, was good for U.S. Steel because it was a way to get rid of the inflation, get rid of it relatively quickly and not have a recession. Yeah, we took some risk, I would say. There were, and you were right to tell your team, uh, you you know, prepare for the worst, uh, and hope for the best. Uh, but uh, uh, by by taking aggressive action up front, then you could control inflation expectations, make sure inflation expectations were remained at two percent. All the business pricing stays at two percent inflation. And then you, uh, this is what brings the prices under control, and you end up back on the path. So I, the way I think about this is divide the post-war era and, and our careers and lives into halves uh, and cut, cut it about 1995 or maybe 1985. Uh, before that, the Fed didn't have any credibility. So uh, all these things were happening and inflation was running all over the place. You uh, went off Bretton Woods, all kinds of things. And no one knew what to expect. They didn't know what the policy was. They didn't know what the policy was going to be in the future. And we got chaos out of that. You had inflation, not just in the US, but around the world. And the, the problem with that was not just that you were putting up with inflation, but that you had an extremely cyclical economy as well. Four recessions in 13 years uh, in the 70s era uh, in the U.S. and just as bad uh, other places around the world. Uh, but then uh, in the in the 90s, especially uh, the Greenspan era, uh, the Fed really established credibility. We hit 2% inflation in 1995, and, and inflation averaged 2% between 1995 and 2005. So in that era, now you have a lot of credibility. You actually named an inflation target uh, in 2012. Uh, you said, we're going to manage to this target. Uh, we're going to adjust interest rates up and down according to these variables. Of course, there's a lot of ambiguity around that and stuff. But still, it's, it's far more credible than it was in the 70s. And this has enabled us to say, credibly, uh, we're going to bring the inflation down. There doesn't have to be a recession. But uh, we're going to have much lower inflation than what we had before. Uh, that has generally worked. And coming back to the yield curve, uh, I've been, I was one uh, that cited the yield curve, especially in 2019, uh, to lower the policy rate because um, I was worried about the yield curve signaling uh, recession at that time. Um, but I, <laughs> I'm going to say the most dangerous words that you just uttered uh, this time is different <laughs> on the yield curve. Uh, I think that the inverted yield curve has been a nominal inversion, the one, the one that we've just experienced and are still experiencing, because markets were expecting quite a bit of inflation over the next two years or one year to two years, but not very much inflation out in uh, years three through ten. So uh, because of that, if you're pricing a 10-year security, you're going to price it differently than you price a two-year security. The two-year would have a much bigger inflation premium in it than the 10-year. And that's enough to explain uh, at least a large chunk of the inversion that's been going on. So I think this is a, what I would call a pure nominal inversion mm -hmm. where markets were expecting less inflation in the future than they see today. And because of that, you had inversion in the yield curve. But that's not signaling uh, bad times ahead. That's just signaling that policy is going to be successful in getting inflation back to target. 
But early on, you know, I, I can remember being interviewed and and talking about uh, how pleased I was with with uh, the Fed's response because I don't think we had as good a response back in two thousand and eight. Just seemed like that was really really scary. Where this was a different kind of scary, but it felt like the Fed had it. And maybe it's just you can tell me what you went through before it was like okay, we got this. We know what needs no, to be I, done. I, I think uh, two things. One was that the uh, the disturbance or the shock uh, in 2008 came from Wall Street itself. So uh, it generated, yeah. you know, came right from the inner circle of U.S. finance. Uh, but this time, the the shock came from distant lands, and it was uh, not a yeah. financial shock. So. That was one thing that helped. And then the other thing, I think, was that all those tools have been developed in the Bernanke era. So some of what we could do was just unpack some of those and try them out and see if they would work this time. And, and a lot of it did work. So I think it was it was pretty successful. It, it sounds like you believe we're on the path for a, a relative soft landing with the caveat because yeah, you said something – about the geopolitical, you kind of set that aside oh, I, because sorry, I didn't, that, uh, that's, sorry, I didn't, you know, the existential stuff can always. No, no, I think yeah. fundamentally, I do think uh, we're on, well, we're really arguably have already made the soft landing, uh, depending on how how okay. far you want to go. But, okay. you know, inflation on a CPI basis, on a 12-month CPI basis was, was over 9% at one point. Now it's down to 3%, and unemployment hasn't gone up hardly at all. So uh, right. it's basically where it was. So basically, that's as good as you can get. You brought 600 basis points down on the inflation rate, no increase in the unemployment rate. So uh, and I think that's that trend is going to continue into into the first half of 2024 here. So I think we are going to get uh, a soft landing. Now, on the geopolitical side, uh, you're, you're, I mean, two wars going on, uh, you know, first land war in Europe you know, since World War II. I mean, uh, that can blow up at any moment. Uh, and uh, some some mornings you wake up and you're not sure what the headline is telling you. Um, so I, I it's it's true that there's a lot of geopolitical risk. And and uh, but that that's not monetary policy. That's something understand. else that could on the, on the that's on a really the good policy. point. That's a good point. Of course, we have to consider those things in terms of how we think about this. So sure. it sounds like monetary policy, we should expect a, a soft landing, then it's it's more the weather prediction a year from now. What's going yeah. to happen? Is the Ukraine thing going to wrap up? Probably not. Is the Israeli yeah. conflict, is it going to sp spread? Who really knows? Yeah. I mean, we back in the day, we really worried about that because of our oil situation. We we were so dependent on oil before. The other thing yeah. is, is, is you think about things like housing and all this credit card debt and, you know, all the money that was put in people's pockets. And now it seems like the service is getting much better now because people are coming back to work and we're getting um, so we're we're seeing in restaurants things that seem to be better service as well. And they're not, you know, having to close early. Everything seems to be more normal. Uh, but I do worry about the, the trillion dollars of credit card debt, the housing with the interest rates where they are right now. People are kind of holding on to their housing. And we saw this big increase in housing, but we still got the overhang um, on the rental property, particularly the, you know, the, the, the big buildings where people used to work all the time downtown, where now there's so much hybrid work that people aren't going to be coming back. I think that train's left the station. I think we've all found at USDO, we work from wherever. We're, we're a lot more productive uh, working from wherever than going into a, uh, you know, a, a specific desk in, uh, in our office every day, although it's available to us because you got longer term rent agreements. But all yeah. that kind of stuff just feels like, you know, there's a tension there that's got to be figured out. Could you talk about all that other ancillary stuff that could hurt the landing? Yeah, um, I, I would say on the um, uh, kind of excess savings that households had based on the uh, fiscal policy during the pandemic, I think most of that has been spent down now. So I don't think that's going to be a factor in 2024. 
Uh, I do think, though, that consumers are in good shape, and that's because the labor market is in good shape. Uh, the unemployment rate at 3.7 percent is only two ticks above a 50-year low. Amazing. So, I mean, uh, how good is it going to get? I mean, uh, uh, unemployment insurance claims hovering around 200,000, a ridiculously low number. Uh, you've still got more job openings today than you have unemployed people. Uh, that's not has was not usually the case between 2009 and 2017 or 18. Um, so I think um, uh, you've just got this very strong labor market. Usually, when people have jobs, then the consumption uh, follows right behind. So we seems like we're in good shape on that dimension. On the housing, uh, I mean, I'd I'd like to hear your views. I I think uh, uh, the housing market is. Uh, is puzzling. I think we've undersupplied housing in the U.S. since 2009 because you got, you know, at that point you had too many houses and, and all these uh, builders got burned and so they're very careful in the decade that followed to not build too much but now I think we have a kind of a structural shortage um, and then you had these very low uh, mortgage rates, uh, especially associated with the pandemic, but even earlier than that, so that when interest rates went up, people don't want to sell their house, as you mentioned. Um, you've got, uh, so that I think is very quirky. Uh, that What you're seeing there is that the house prices of the houses that are selling are actually up again, and they were up a lot during the pandemic. So. Um, there's many cross currents in that market that I don't think are going to get fully resolved for a long time uh, just because of the way those dynamics work. And then the, I would say on the commercial real estate, um, I have a couple comments on this. Commercial real estate is actually a big category. And so it's not just tall buildings in Manhattan. Uh, it's many other things as uh, strip malls and land and other many other kinds of things. Uh, so the the part that is really the central city, very tall buildings, especially the glam cities, uh, the famous cities in America, that's really a pretty small slice of the total commercial real estate uh, package. Um, I think that that kind of property is owned by very patient capital, um, sovereign wealth funds and, and things like that around pension funds from around the world. They already know that their value of their asset has gone down, but they're also very patient and they'll think about other things that they might do. So I don't really see that being a business cycle kind of concern. Uh, it's a concern in the sense that, okay, the world is changing and these, are, these buildings aren't going to be as useful as they once were. But on the other hand, is it going to cause a recession in 2024? I don't really think so. Uh, I think that's a that's a problem that will unwind over five to ten years uh, as as these owners decide, you know, what do they want to do with their these properties? Well, you're making me a believer. I, I have to say that that was really helpful. Thank you. Because okay, I, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm I'm a bit of doom and gloom kind of guy all the time, and trying to make sure that we're able to withstand whatever comes our way, but. I, I, I do sense the optimism in your voice and and especially with monetary policy. Now, who knows on the geopolitical side what, what happens there, but th this is really, really encouraging. There's one other thing I did want to ask you, because when you have a career in banking for, would you say, 15 years, right? And now you do this pivot to something entirely different. It, could, could you talk a little bit about that adaptation and what it's like and how it's going? Because imagine, and I don't, I'm not pretending what it's like to to to, to be uh, in the in the banking um, uh, business or what it's like to be in. So I don't know, but I, I imagine the pace is different. And so, how do you think about that? And what's it been like for you to make the change? Uh, well, it's been really fun. Uh, uh, Purdue's been very welcoming uh, to me, and uh, it's a great project. Uh, this uh, school is named after uh, Mitch Daniels, uh, who's the president that just stepped down about one year ago, former governor of Indiana, and uh, well-loved uh, here and across the country. Uh, so we've got a great namesake and a great tradition to live up to, uh, to build up um, uh, the Daniels School of Business. You know, there's a great brand here already, which is the Cranert uh, School of Management brand. 
And the idea of those guys in the 60s uh, when they started it was to take Purdue's technological prowess and mix it with the business school, and they, they certainly did that. Uh, and we're just kind of carrying on that tradition under this rebranding. And uh, I, I just think there's just so much chance for success here. Um, the uh, uh, you know Purdue is is about 70 percent STEM students. Uh, technology just permeates the place, and technological innovation permeates the place. 250 patents uh, last year on campus. So uh, just really a lot. So the idea is to is to blend the uh, number four engineering school in the country and the and the business school and just create a very powerful and different kind of business school than what we've seen. Uh, around the rest of the country and be distinctive relative to the other great business schools that are out there. Well, I, well, I think they're very fortunate to have you in, in the background you have is so impressive and, and really have to thank you for your service really to, to the world because of the things that you help navigate through. It's really impressive and, and I greatly appreciate you taking the time with, with our team here to, to share your, your insights. I'll give you the final word and, you know, any advice you'd like to give us here at U.S. Steel? Well, you're, uh, you're in a cyclical business, but uh, things are looking pretty good for 2024. You should always, uh, always be prepared in case something goes wrong, but uh, looking pretty good. And so I hope you can have a profitable year and, and some good outcomes. Well, everybody, that, that, that's that been Dean Bullard, Jim Bullard. We're getting to know you a little bit better now. Thank you so very much for your insights. And, uh, and, and we look forward to having further discussions with you. And uh, we'll definitely be in touch. All right. Steel Stories is brought to you by U.S. Steel. To find out more about our sustainable steel solutions and how our best for all strategy allows us to re-envision the future alongside our customers, visit www.ussteel.com. Search for U.S. Steel in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. And make sure to hit subscribe so you never miss a future episode. On behalf of the team here at US Steel, thanks for listening. Yeah.